Well, Barbara, you must have done a very good job because there's very little overlap so far in our talks. So um, thank you for having me. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that arise and also the opportunities that we've seen in the real world implementation of genomic profiling and how it might interplay with um, eligibility around a national clinical uh, trial uh, system. Our vision, I thought David almost had the exact same wording on his penultimate or near penultimate slide that uh, I think is shared by most in this room. Each patient's treatment needs to be informed by an understanding of the molecular changes driving his or her disease. I'm going to start with a couple of cases. And, and everything we do, I think, at Foundation Medicine is really driven by um, outcomes and, and, and cases we see in the clinic. And this is a case uh, from uh, a colleague at Fox Chase of a woman with advanced inflammatory breast cancer involving liver and bone. She had uh, her two amplification on uh, fish testing, received a series of systemic chemotherapies, and the all too usual um, series of diminishing periods of treatment as each line of therapy ensued with less benefit and greater toxicity. And um, in this, uh, her tumor specimen was, was sent to us, uh, and as I'll detail on the next slide, we actually found an exon 21 L858R uh, point mutation. And I, having worked on this early on, thought this is purely heresy. We only see these in lung cancers. This must be metastatic lung cancer, but it wasn't. And uh, it was an eye-opener to me early on in my, in my time at uh, Foundation Medicine that uh, what you don't look for, you won't find. And so, of course, this is not commonly tested for in advanced uh, uh, breast cancer settings and shows the potential utility of a broad-based, highly sensitive uh, NGS test to find a, a driver lesion in a breast cancer. And this is how it would have been captured uh, on our uh, report, just with the, the, uh, the excerpted part on the right highlighting this mutation, the other genomic alterations, including finding a PI3 kinase mutation and the ERB2 amplification. And so this individual was, um, unfortunately, there was no clinical trial available for this individual. Uh, her oncologist pursued off-label use of erlotinib and obtained such. And here's paired PET CT scans from early on with a diminution in the FDG avidity of the left supraclavicular node and follow-up scans in January are still good. And most importantly, the patient feels substantially better. I'm going to present a second case that I shared with colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, that presents a bit of a contradistinction in, I think, things went exactly in this case as one would have hoped, and that we closed the loop, and we closed the loop through a clinical trial. And this is a never-smoking woman who presented in mid-2010 with metastatic lung adenocarcinoma involving bone, and uh, she actually presented with visual changes because she had retinal metastases. And spectacular but focused, highly sensitive but focused in-house testing with a sequinome-based platform did not reveal a driver uh, oncogenic lesion. And post hoc, as we knew um, observations are made of, of critical lesions, we go back, develop a test from the R&D lab, and then validate them clinically. A ROS1 fish test was negative, and a PCR looking for a specific fusion, the KIF5B RET fusion that had been discovered uh, by uh, Foundation Medicine in collaboration with the Dana-Farber group was also negative. Um, this lady had been started on systemic chemotherapy with pemetrexid, cisplatin, and bevacizumab, and by lung cancer standards did relatively well for nearly two years uh, with her therapy, but then in April did experience disease progression. She was given an empiric shot at erlotinib in the hopes that she might have a response uh, related to either mutation not tested for or some other mechanism that was ineffective. And again, her tumor specimen was then sent to us. And we identified a novel uh, RET fusion. And you'll hear a bit about the test shortly, but that's not the, the primary focus of the presentation today, I don't think. Because we uh, uh, bait the introns that are involved in the uh, fusions uh, almost canonically, uh, for most of these uh, driver oncogenes, we were able to identify a novel oncogenic fusion partner for RET, TRIM33. Obviously, there are several drugs that are approved in other indications that might be putatively active against RET fusions. But most importantly, the doctors um, uh, did have a clinical trial available for this patient. And without being uh, specific as to what agent was used in this setting, uh, this individual began um, 
systemic uh, oral therapy, had a robust response um, in her tumor, bone pain resolved, it's not a confirmed uh, PR, and there have been several other PRs seen in this trial. And this was a, a real gratifying case for all involved as we really closed the loop uh, from the testing to lead back to a clinical trial and seeing objective benefit for this advanced lung cancer patient. So I'm not going to um, spend a lot of time on this. Uh, the slide at the left, uh, Levi knows well, and this is the hills and valley. And I think the hills do outnumber the uh, hills outnumber the uh, the mountains uh, and uh, and are critically important. And that's a lot of what we're talking about here today. And the other key to the course to the broad based approach in testing is that pathways need to be interrogated. In David's case, with two lesions in the same pathway, perhaps predicting sensitivity to the TORC1 inhibitor, I think really hit home on that. It's like a clinical trial. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So. <laughs> but it is over 50%. So, so what are the challenges in the clinic? Limited tissue, right? So everybody thinks they have a marker. It could be IHC. It could be FISH. It could be expression. It could be copy number change. It could be homozygous deletion. So that's a real challenge. Um, even within just looking at a DNA alteration, there's multiple classes of alterations. We can have point mutations. We can have uh, copy number changes. We can have uh, rearrangements and, uh, and, uh, and base substitutions. And of course, from the, from the pure clinical standpoint for the doc in practice, the challenges of sending tissues to multiple labs, having the office pull back in those results, integrating them, without having been trained in an error of perhaps even genomics, much less cancer genomics, makes this incredibly challenging. So um, and, you know, our approach at Foundation has been to really link what we think is the best in genome technology, clinical oncology, cancer biology, and information science to create a test where the lowest common denominator is to make this test applicable to routine clinical practice. Small biopsies, community hospital, docs not necessarily trained in this complicated area, and then to distill down those 17,000 uh, variants to a report that means something to the doctor as he or she goes in to see a patient in clinic. And um, I, I think there's a couple of things perhaps lost on those who don't work in this space is that the sequencing box is not the most critical piece to this. In fact, it's a relatively modest but necessary part of it. The pre-analytic process of DNA extraction, the sequencing and optimization uh, to obtain even coverage across the sequenced area of the genome, and then the back end, the post-sequencing part that you heard a little bit about, the analysis pipeline and the algorithms used for each component of a broad uh, NGS test, and then the report driven to the doctor in a clinically relevant time frame is really a lot, a lot of the work and the human touch to this. And, and I don't believe, as we were talking earlier, there is a soup to nuts automated process to handle this in 2013. And so translating research grade next generation sequencing to a clinical cancer diagnostic assay requires extensive optimization, months and years, lots of dollars at every step, except perhaps at the sequencer. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of the analytic validation that's been undertaken at, at Foundation Medicine by colleagues of mine. Um, for example, you have a 200 plus gene test. So the premise of our test, if some, as many of you may know, is take the 24, 25,000 genes, take the 1 percent or so unambiguously implicated to be somatically altered in human cancer, and study the heck out of them, both in breadth by looking broadly across tumor types, but in depth by attaining tremendous coverage. And so how does one validate any component of that test, particularly when some of the genes are tumor suppressor genes where a mutation can occur at any point along that gene? So one strategy that's been employed, and I, to me it looked incredibly elegant, maybe to others it's mundane, would be to use pooled HapMap cell lines that contain, of course, characteristic SNPs, mix them in various proportions, and of mutant allele frequency, and then sequence them and compare results with the known uh, SNP uh, content. 
And in that approach, uh, we've proceeded across the various components of this test, the base substitutions, the indels, the copy number alterations, and obtained extremely robust sensitivity uh, for the base substitutions with sensitivity of 99% or greater to detect a mutant allele frequency of 5%, 98% or greater for small indels, 1 to 40 base pairs at a mutant allele frequency of 10% or above, and for copy number, either homozygous deletion or a copy number greater than 8 with a sensitivity greater than 95%. And this is with 20% or greater tumor nuclei. Real world tumor, with all due respect for the spectacular work done in TCGA, not 70% tumor rich specimens. So I think one, you know, one of the messages here is that we need to develop common criteria, whatever they are for the testing that we accept, perhaps, for our clinical trials. Um, and these are just blow-ups of some of the, some of the challenges um, that uh, using, requiring, say, if one's looking for copy number change by a different metric, of course, that depleting tissue, and in, in the converse being, if one can encompass it with a, with a different test, such as a clinical, clinical NGS approach we're describing, then tissue may be conserved. I don't think anyone's saying there's one test that soup to nuts encompasses everybody's wish list here for a cancer test in 2013 or beyond, but I think this is a, uh, a great starting place. Another example is what we talk about in, you know, in, in lung cancer. And in lung cancer, depending on whose pie you look at, if you're far to the left and you can say ALK, EGFR, and RAS, and stop there, and if you're far to the right, maybe like David or I or others, you think there's 20 or 30 things we want to know about. Arguably, this is, you know, the lung cancer list. I think many of us would be interested in who have either um, clinical trials and or desire to treat with the best available targeted therapy. And the premise, of course, when you look across this, with a couple of exceptions, is that the number of clinically relevant alterations in a single patient is low but the number of clinically relevant alterations across the disease state is high. And people can pick and choose. Maybe this one shouldn't be on the list. Maybe that one should be. But I think um, this list is quite concordant with some of the diagrams uh, Levi showed from other, other diseases. Same message, maybe slight different in numbers or content. So again, our current, our current um, assay, just so people know what we're talking about and think how might this or might does not serve the needs of a clinical trials process or initiative, a broader one, it, again, sequences the entire coding region of more than 200 cancer-related genes, the introns in 20 genes frequently arranged in human cancer, and we've optimized it, again, speaking to the idea of being able to take care of patients everywhere and not just the tumor coming out of the OR memorial, we've optimized it for fine needle aspirations, core biopsies, and malignant effusions. And um, median coverage more than 250x, but the critical piece being 99% of exons covered more than 100x, and extreme uniformity even within those exons, maybe ranging from 80 to 120 or 90 to 110 on average. And skip over the, the report itself. Let me show you a couple of examples of patient uh, reports, de-identified, of course, that we sent out. And the concept here being exactly what David spoke to, either the unusual alteration or the unusual tumor type. Here's adrenal cortical carcinoma. There's probably, and, and, and parenthetically, of the tumor types we see, many tend to be tumor types for which there's either no approved therapy or the approved therapy is a de facto standard. And here's an adrenal cortical carcinoma where there's first-line therapy. One can argue how effective it is or not. Uh, possibly some second-line ther therapy, but certainly a virulent disease. And this tumor had MDM amplification, and as those of you who read the New York Times know, there's a number of inhibitors of this uh, currently under study, and we'll see whether they uh, are efficacious or not. And there was also CDK4 amplification uh, in this tumor specimen. Here we 
we go. Here's a gallbladder tumor, oh, all right, on schedule. So this, this tumor had a number of alterations, including amplification in two FGFR family members, MDM2, PI3 kinase point mutation. This is a type point mutation that would be picked up by sensitive hotspot testing, and a mutation in FBXW7, which has been associated uh, in at least one case report with sensitivity to uh, an mTOR and also resistance potentially to taxanes. One of the funny things is sometimes pharma comes up and asks, well, how do I treat this patient? I don't know. We're just giving you the data. You have to, you know, come up with the rest of it here. But the, there is a question here about the strategies and combinations and so forth that might be most uh, logical in, in some of the, when one's looking at a broad test. Here's an adenoid cystic carcinoma in which amplification of three oncogenes that are in uh, 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 on the same amplicon, KDR, KIT, and PDGFR alpha was noted. This individual actually was treated on a clinical trial and also uh, has ongoing durable benefit in a, a study at Memorial Sloan Kettering. So the message here, I think, that's been conveyed from multiple speakers is the concept of a, a long tail. And this is a uh, histogram of the genes, a subset of the genes, the curve goes too far to the right, we saw altered in our first 2,200 uh, clinical cases. It's not been updated uh, in the last couple of weeks, but showing this long tail on the curve with a number of genes being altered uh, at somewhere between 1 and 5 percent frequency in often an unpredictable fashion, arguing for, indeed, both the idea of a broad-based test and trials, nimble trials that are available to accommodate that, perhaps like those uh, David described earlier. This type of tail, the, ch the shape of it may change slightly, but the general concept maintains. Here's lung cancer, breast cancer, and colorectal cancer, and uh, multiple genes uh, altered in each of those, often at low frequency. Of the um, 180 plus genes that were in our last iteration of our test when we recently submitted a validation paper for the current uh, version, the 182 genes that were in the last version of our test, 155 were reported out of somatically altered in the first 1,000 plus patients. Fusions and kinases across multiple tumor types. Again, I think if we sat around and talked about what are the low-hanging fruit as far, as far as therapeutic targets. Oncogenic fusions that are overexpressed would be right at the top of the list. And here we've seen ALK across multiple tumor types with different partners. How quickly could we complete an ALK bucket trial, a RET bucket trial, fusions involving FGFR with different FGFR inhibitors, et cetera? And this is another, another way of looking. This is the, sort of the clinical, uh, real-time, advanced stage uh, output of what David uh, showed you from uh, Nikki Schultz's work on, uh, from the TCGA and, and the published literature, BRAF across tumor types, KIT across tumor types, RET, FGFR, PDGFR alpha, and LKB1. So a word about pharma, and, um, you know, we have a number of announced uh, relationships with pharma at Foundation Medicine, and they generally involve a variety of different types of trials. They can be rescue trials for drugs that failed, or maybe there were occasional responses seen. They can be longitudinal studies, perhaps looking for causes of resistance over time. Uh, they can be uh, prospective studies where individuals are assigned to a line of therapy based on the presence or absence of one or more alterations in a gene or, or uh, a series of genes. And uh, this presents a potential opportunity, I think, around screening patients for studies. But also, I think it, it speaks to the idea that for us to be successful, there have to be, in my mind, I'm actually jumping to, I think, uh, conclusion three, which is that there are a number of pre-competitive areas of collaborations amongst pharmas, liberalized eligibility, basket trials, um, I think making rules if they were if multiple genomic alterations as to which therapy would be, you know, identified first, et cetera. And I think that type of um, collaboration would be critical to any effort in this space. I think, I think that implica uh, implementation of a, a uh, clinical comprehensive next-gen sequencing test 
for FFPE small tumor samples has been shown to be feasible, but it does require extensive experience and meticulous validation. Uh, I think we have the converted here that this approach offers tremendous promise to improve outcomes, but it only does so when we can capitalize on the good results or the opportun opportunities that go out the door every day to doctors and patients in the community. Every day we send out results to docs, and although we have a number of prospective studies and these decision impact studies and so forth, more often than not, we know the doc in the community, for whatever reason, is not empowered to get that patient on a study. He can't get the CT scans on a disc. He can't take the hour to call the doc at the other center, see if he's, the patient's eligible for the study. When he or she does, he often finds that the trial's closed, they're between dose levels, et cetera. And there's that inherent inertia on the part of both doctor and patient that makes it a really challenging area. Um, I think that, in theory, use of a broad, robust testing platform in concert with a broad and effective clinical trials network should accelerate accrual to trials, minimize off-label use, i.e., have that first patient I showed you participate in a basket trial for allotinib and EGFR mutant tumors and other tumor types, and allow patient access to agents that are more likely to be efficacious. So I'm going to stop there. I think that's my last slide, and, um, and I look forward to hearing your questions in the discussion period. Thank you.